Okay. Good afternoon. We're here for a workshop. We're going to start out with Mr. Dave Jones and discuss winter sidewalk maintenance. Take it away. So I've uh, I prepared a fairly detailed uh, summary for the council that is in your package. Uh, for those of the public, I figured I might just kind of go through and summarize it for them, and then we can open it up to questions and comments from council and however you want to uh, proceed after that. Uh, so just a reminder, we've got uh, over 80 miles of sidewalk in the city. <clears throat> we do not clear snow from all 80 miles of the sidewalks. We clear snow only from about 50 miles of the, of the sidewalks. Uh, and quite frankly, uh, up until about 10 or 12 years ago, it had been the abutting property owners that were responsible for uh, clearing the snow from the from the sidewalks in front of their properties and stuff. However, the city council at that time changed that and eliminated that requirement. Uh, <coughs> prior to that, and this was, goes back long before I even started with the city back in 1999, the, the council had approved Public Works Department clearing snow from specific sidewalks. Uh, and there had been a, uh, my understanding is that the council at that time had identified the sidewalks that they wanted uh, the Public Works Department to clear snow from and had worked with them to identify the priorities of, of the sidewalks that we would do. Um, we've got about 50 miles of sidewalks that the department does clear snow from. There is a map on the city's website, and seeing one over here, and there's also a smaller version in your package that kind of outlines that. The, yeah, the uh, routes that are highlighted in yellow are what we call our priority sidewalks. Those are the ones that we do first, and it's primarily in the downtown area and around the schools where we've got uh, walking for the schools and stuff. There, the other... Um, there's about 33 miles of the 50 miles of sidewalks that we plow are on those priority routes. Uh, there are secondary routes that are done after all the priorities are done. There's about 17 miles of those, and you can see those by just where it's red line but not yellow highlighted on the maps and stuff. We have three primary sidewalk machines. Uh, that we use to do our sidewalk plowing. We have a fourth machine that's a 1995 trackless. Uh, we use it primarily for backup and parts uh, because it's not up very much and not, not available to actually do some of the work. Uh, we supplement those three uh, primary machines with the 804 Toolcat, which is a Bobcat uh, that we've outfitted with a blower and and it can do some of the wider sidewalks like in the downtown area, like on Lisbon Street. It does well on that, but it's too wide to do our regular sidewalks uh, out in the neighborhoods and, and on some of the primary street stuff. So it's a good thing that it, we have it because it actually supplements our regular sidewalk plows and frees them up to actually address some of the other sidewalks. Uh, we've got one operator assigned to each of the sidewalk plows. Um, there are no backups, so when their shift is done, the, the machine's either uh, uh, put back in the garage and, and doesn't go back out, or we try and get some volunteers from the highway division if we've got anybody available that hasn't already worked 16 or 18 hours plowing snow uh, to actually put them out on, on the thing. Um, I also included in your packet the list of, of uh, sidewalks and the order in which each unit does them. Uh, we prioritize them to try and take advantage of their start and end period so that it lines up and they go from, right from one to another to another and, and walk through their, uh, through their list for the plow routes. Um, I did also include in your package some photos of the machines just so you had an idea of what they look like. Uh, Toolcat, most people have seen downtown and stuff, that's, that's on the left. And the three primary machines were down the right. The <coughs> 804, which was on a separate sheet, 
sitting up on blocks uh, in, in our garage. Uh, it's still sitting there. Uh, we're hoping to be able to get some uh, repairs done on that here soon. So um, let's see, where are we at? So we've got, during the recent storms, we were doing some tracking as far as how uh, how much we could actually get done during the storm each shift and stuff. We were keeping track of, um, of how much they actually were getting done. Uh, we averaged, uh, and now this was during, or uh, right after a, a fairly good sized storm. We had a 13 and a half inch storm followed by about six inches a, a few days later. Uh, so it was a little bit slow going but they were doing about 3.4 miles of sidewalk per 12 hour shift on average. Um, so using that and figuring uh, you've got uh, 33 miles of sidewalk, it's gonna take you roughly about 10 12 hour shifts in order to complete just the primaries uh, and about 15, uh, 12-hour shifts in order to uh, complete the uh, both the primaries and secondary uh, sidewalks. The other thing I'll mention is that we found that uh, we can't count on all three of those machines being up all the time. Generally speaking, what we found is about 66% of the time is, is what we can expect for best uh, uh, amount of availability for these machines. Uh, they do uh, take a beating while they're out there. Uh, we do run into stuff that we don't see. Uh, I'll pass this around. That's just a photo of a uh, a uh, piece of, of equipment that w w our snowblower chewed up and, and spat out uh, as part of the uh, regular run going through, and it's a it's a child's bike, that, small bike that that basically got eaten up by one of our snowblowers and stuff. And that that isn't you know you see the damage on the bike, but uh, that also damages the snowblower itself and the impellers and stuff. So. It has some impact there. So at best, what we figured is around 66% availability of the uh, snow blowers during the storm. Uh, we had times where we've had three snow blowers actually up and working uh, for at least part of the storm. We've had it where we've got down so that we didn't have any snow blowers working. Uh, but generally speaking, we average around two uh, that were actually working as, as part of the storm. So figuring uh, two machines working a 12-hour shift, it's going to take us five days just to complete the priority routes. If you add the uh, secondary routes, it'll take us roughly seven to eight days at that production rate that we saw during the last storm. And again, small storms, you might do it a little faster than that, but I'm just giving you the data we had for that, that particular storm. <clears throat> if we want to add additional areas that uh, uh, are not on the current plow list, that's going to extend the amount of time that it's going to take in order to get, get the uh, uh, the sidewalk's done, uh, or we could add equipment and personnel that might help get it done faster. But that's the information I prepared for the council. I'd be happy to entertain any questions or comments or thoughts that you might have. Council Pat, yeah. uh, Question on the, the 804, the one that does downtown Lisbon Street. Yeah. Um, where where does that fall in the priority of actually going out? Because I see essentially downtown Lisbon Street is a priority run. Yeah. Um, but I've been out there many times, and it's 
it's pretty pretty bad. Yeah. Um, you know, comparably, I've been um, I actually made it a, a point to go um, to Main Street in Auburn, where Gritty's is, um, and they were they were down to tar. There was no snow anywhere, and you you could make quite a few snowmen with the snow that we had on on our Lisbon Street. Yeah. Um, so what's I, I I would like to see us make it a big priority to get downtown clean so we can support our businesses that are down there. Yeah. Um, so what what's the priority of, of that unit actually getting out that, to that, that area? That unit usually is the first first one to go out, and it goes out actually during the storm sometimes. Um, so during the day, if we uh, uh, we may be still at the height of the storm and stuff, and we'll put that one uh, downtown, just just going through trying to clean up Lisbon Street and, yep. and some of those areas and stuff. So it is the first one that goes out. Generally speaking, our other ones we hold off until like 11 o'clock at night because it's uh, easier to clear some of the uh, 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 sidewalks af after the rush hour is gone. We're not having to compete with traffic going whizzing past us on Lisbon Street or out Sabata Street and stuff. So uh, the tool cats out fairly early in the storm. Yeah. Um, and then I noticed on the Bates listing, um, it said something about uh, contractors opening it up. Is that us not doing the work? Some, or? Sometimes Bates College does have some of their uh, uh, folks do some of the sidewalks in the area around the college and yeah. stuff. So, so I mean, we, if, they, if they get there before us, then by all means, we take advantage <laughs> of that. So we're yeah. not complaining about them doing sidewalks. Yeah, no, absolutely not. I, just, I wasn't sure. Another another area that has a lot of a lot of foot traffic. So yeah. I, I just yeah. wanted to, to make certain. But thank you. Yeah. Council Cludier. Um. So two councils ago, when we had then Councilor Libby, now Senator Libby, um, we purchased a new um, sidewalk plow. Which right. I think is the 804. Yeah. Is that correct? No, no. Actually, it was the. Uh, 817, I think. So uh, the, uh, the 80, what that, we had three before that. This, that made it four. Yep. Okay, the fourth one is still our, our old 1995 uh, machine stuff, which we do have up for replacement this next year, so. Okay, so I guess that was the point I was trying to get at, was that two councils ago, we felt like we needed four sidewalk plows. Mm -hmm. We're now at a point where we've only got two that are functional. Well, we've got three. We've got three, but, but you, you can only count on counting about on two, two yeah. to be functional. Yeah. Um, do we have a plan to get back up to the four? Because clearly, two councils ago, we felt like we needed four of them. Yeah. I don't well, think that the I need mean, has we've, decreased. We've got a replacement plan for the 809. There's another one, I think, two years behind that, <coughs> two years after that. Uh, if we if we want to if we had a fifth machine if you will uh, I figure 66 percent of, of five is probably closer to three mm -hmm. um, that would that would certainly help the reliability and the availability of the equipment as they were going through but okay. that's where we're at so far mm -hmm. Um, a few weeks ago, and you know about this, I yep. wanted to let the council know, um, uh, I received a call from a constituent who was uh, really desperate for us to uh, plow um, about a half, a half mile section, would you say, even, or a quarter mile section of a... Of a yeah, I, I haven't actually measured that out, Jolene, but I'm a... I can, I can find that out for it's you. It's the section from uh, Chickadee Restaurant to Phillips Element. And I'd say it's quarter of a mile to half a mile. Uh, I know the plow goes on Lisbon Street up to Chickadee Restaurant. It goes to is Pleasant, Pleasant Street, Street right Street. now. Yeah. Well, Pleasant Street is yeah. that where Chickadee Restaurant is. Now, that's, Chickadee's actually further out than that. So. Is it further yeah. than Pleasant? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Next intersection. A down. little bit, okay. Um, so it maybe that adds it to maybe we'll say half yep. a mile, uh, but uh, the problem was that uh, there are two streets that go go from Lisbon Streets onto this little neighborhood, um, Wynn Street and 
I'm forgetting the other one. Is it Drew? I think it's Drew. Drew yeah. Street. And it's a tiny neighborhood. It's a dead-end neighborhood. The only way people have to get out of that neighborhood, and my, my husband and I drove through it, so we you can't go through to another street or go out the back way or a side street. It's all blocked in by houses and you have to go on somebody's lawn. And um, of course the lawns have snow on them, so just as bad as walking on an unplowed uh, sidewalk. The only way a pedestrian has to, or cars, uh, to get out onto Lisbon Street is, is to get out on Lisbon Street if they, get, if they leave that neighborhood. There are several elderly people who live in that neighborhood who have to walk where they're going. And so I imagine they're going out, they have to leave for food and, and things, that necessities, and they walk on Lisbon Street. And the person that I talked to is in that position, and he was also talking about an elderly gentleman that he knows, and he's, as, as we were talking, he says, I see him, I see him, I see him walking. And he was right on Lisbon Street, and. I can't, we went out there, I took pictures, and I forgot to bring the pictures, but the cars are just lined up at the light at Chickadee Restaurant. They zoom up from Lisbon, on Lisbon Street, they're going really fast, and then they start slowing down and jockeying for a lane to stop at the light, and people are walking right there where the cars are stopping. So to me it was, when I saw that, I thought, oh, this, this is horrible, but um, it just seemed like it was impossible to get that done um, until this week, I think. Uh, it got last week. Last week, um, yes. so I, but, but we had to do what? Put the plow? Uh, we actually did snow removal out there, and, and instead of starting at Foch is where we normally start, this is up just inside uh, where Pleasant Street is, we went all the way out to Elmet and, and did went that snow the other removal way. from that all the way inbound. And so is so. that going to continue working? Because <clears throat> it seems to me this is, there was another issue. Uh, some people who live in that neighborhood work at Phillips Elmet and they walk on Lisbon Street um, uh, from their house um, at night because they work the night shift. Yeah. And uh, of course, with no sidewalk, that's very dangerous. And there is a sidewalk that goes all the way to yeah. Elmet, so, so it can be plowed. Yeah. So is that something that you're going to be able to continue doing? Well, that, that we, we did it this time as a, uh, 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 something we don't normally do during, during our snow removal. It's not something we would do after every uh, single uh, storm. Uh, if the council wants to add that section, I can certainly uh, take a look and see how much extra effort that's going to take and how long it is and what, what we do. Uh, we do have a, uh, this, the section of Lisbon Street from Pleasant Street into Scribner Avenue on that side is on the secondary list. It's not a priority. Uh, sidewalk. It's done after the, hour, the priorities are done, um, and that that's about a 1,500 uh, foot long section. I suspect from where we currently uh, clear the sidewalks out to where Phillips Element is, it would be at least another 1,500 feet, uh, if not more. Um, to get there, so I mean, we'd have to take a look at the thing, and and I give the council some ideas on on how we might be able to do that. If we did do that though, I'd add it, I'd probably recommend we add it as, a, as an additional secondary route uh, and just have that machine that does that section of Lisbon Street, just add that to their list, so. Councilor Uh So I see on the schedule for the 804 unit, it seems to be a much shorter list and I understand there are some limitations with its size um, are those shorter shifts for that operator then because yeah, well, the, the 804 on. is the big unit yep so there's only s certain sidewalks that that can do okay okay uh, that's that's the unit that does our downtown wider sidewalks and stuff it mm -hmm. can't do these these uh, the ones that are like assigned to other Lisbon units Street, so. yeah, on outer Lisbon so okay thank you okay Councillor Goodyear. You didn't have a chance yet, go ahead. 
Councilor LaJoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, what it comes down to is without the proper equipment or the number of equipment. And personnel. And personnel, we're still not going to be able to attain those goals. Correct. Well, I mean, if you're... I mean, you will over a period of time. Yeah, it, we'll, we'll get the sidewalks clear, but is five days... That's correct. Uh, ...enough, or is that quick enough to satisfy the priority routes? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So um, I, I would like to see a proposal for the section that uh, Councilor Beam no. talked about. Um, and I know I've called you about Russell Street before. So I see Russell Street on the 817 plow run, but it's only from College Street to Main Street. And there's a stretch, again, in terms of talking about like smaller neighborhoods, there's that Robinson Garden neighborhood that's behind or across from the um, Merrill Gym at Bates College that I know a lot of residents use the sidewalk on that stretch of uh, there Russell. Is, hold on so I didn't know if I was missing it, that it was somewhere else. Yeah, there, that section is on – forgive me, I don't have these memorized no as worries. far as – uh, which unit does which areas and stuff, but uh, that's all. <coughs> well, let's let's just agree it's on one of these okay. lists here someplace. Okay. And stuff. I think that is on a secondary. Okay. It's not a priority. No, that's fine. I just, stuff, so. I didn't see it. I just wanted to make sure it was yeah. showing up somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Are you talking about college from, uh, Russell from college to East, uh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, East Ave to college. It's on run, uh, unit 813. About and halfway down the, the first priority run. Okay, great. Thanks, Dennis. Mm -hmm. Oh, it is. It's yeah, it is on a priority list, so. Uh, would it be possible to see Unit 804 list, listen, oh my gosh, listed out in the same sort of schedule with the lengths in the future? Oh, for lengths? Yeah. Yeah, I, we just didn't do it because it's special areas and stuff, but we can, we can do that for you That'd if you great. want. Thank you. That's the last And do we have, um, you mentioned we used to have requirements that the people who owned the property were responsible for cleaning the sidewalk yep. for like the hospitals and stuff like that what what is their responsibilities and I went by earlier this afternoon near Central Maine Medical Center and High Street in particular there was a lady who was struggling uh, just in gobs and gobs of snow trying to get to the sidewalk which was filled with snow too so obviously they weren't doing their job because it's not on our list to even show is that something typically that the hospital takes care of? Uh, Gen generally speaking, if it's a private property or, uh, uh, you know, it's not, it's not part of the right of way, if you will, mm -hmm. it's, it's the property owner that's responsible for that. And, and most, most of the uh, businesses, including the hospital, uh, do a fairly decent job of, of addressing their own properties and stuff. It's just a matter of, the uh, sidewalks in front of those properties sometimes aren't done, and that's that's ours. So. Now that's not a violation any longer, or. Um, I'm. I don't. I only deal with what's within the right of way. Uh, the the uh, code enforcement may have some issues or something as far as what's on the on the individual properties and stuff, but that isn't something that I deal with. Uh, but, so. but if High Street is not shown with either a priority or a secondary, there are other sidewalks that aren't, aren't really demarcated on this, on this map, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah there so if there's a sidewalk there, <clears throat> and High Street is a public way, right? Yep. But so you're saying perhaps the sidewalk is not part of that public way in that case? I'm, I'm not sure on that one, Jim, to be honest with you. Okay. So. I mean, I just hate to see the public struggling yeah. in unsafe situations. And I know in the middle of a storm like today, it's, yeah. it's going to be problems. I, th but I, think, I think traditionally the, the uh, hospital has taken care of that area over there. But 
I, I'd have to go back and check. Okay, thank you. So. Council Bain. Well, thank you. I just wanted to add one thing, and the, the fact is we've invested into complete streets. We've um, accepted the, um, the capital improvement plan that says, you know, we want to improve our city. We want to make the city look good. And um, complete streets is part of that and the safe streets. And I just want to say, if we're going to invest in something like that, we need to uh, invest in the equipment and the personnel that we need to, to make our city look good and safe mm -hmm. and be safe because people don't move to cities where um, they have to, they can't even get out on a sidewalk. And really the section I'm talking about is not out in the boondocks. Uh, it's, it's fairly close to town and uh, I think we sh we need to consider that. We need to just, uh, I know we can't do anything, this is a workshop, but I just wanted to put that out. I think it's important to do what we have to do to make sure that all the citizens are safe and that people looking at Lewiston uh, to move to uh, will consider it a safe and pleasant city to move to. Okay. Thank you for that, Dave. And now we move on to discussion of the recycling committee. Oh. Will you take any comments? On I can for you, Mr. Webster. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Bouchard. In fact, I wanted to make you an offer. Uh, Bill Webster, Superintendent of Schools. In the city of Boston, as an example, their mayor makes the decision of whether or not there'll be school on a given day. <laughs> <laughs> if you would like that responsibility, I'd be pleased to give it to you. Not a chance. <laughs> no, don't go there, Shane. He's tried to give that to me, too. I mean, the kids no. would never go to school, so. <laughs> so uh, thank you for giving me a, a minute here. I, I want to start by saying that I recognize up front uh, and, and will acknowledge the great work of our public works uh, department and uh, 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 Mr. Jones. Clearly, if there isn't sufficient staffing or equipment, they're not going to be able to meet perhaps some of the expectations that we might have. There are roughly a thousand students that walk to school any day that there's school. Sadly, that number is going down every year as in part uh, families become increasingly sensitive to safety issues. The number of families that are now driving their children to school even though they're within walking distance on a priority sidewalk, I, I think is sad and detracts from the wellness of, of our citizens. I walked on the streets in the downtown area off of uh, Longley, Howe, Horton in that area, and there's one side of those streets that's a priority, I believe. Uh, one week after the uh, January 4th storm, there was still an impossibility for many students to be able to walk to school without walking in the road. And in many cases, it wasn't for a lack of the, of the sidewalk plow trying, but some of the snowbanks from plowing driveways was well in excess of seven or eight feet in, in cases. I don't know what the answer is, but I'd like to at least throw out this idea for the council and for Republic Works to consider. Can we not give our priority sidewalks at least the same priority that we give the least traveled roads in Lewiston? Because our safety of kids is at stake. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now we will move on to the recycling portion of the workshop. <laughs> Mr. Jones. Uh, actually, did you want this yeah. one? I can, I can certainly uh, open this up. Um, from what I understand, there, there, there was a uh, recycling committee um, a few years ago, at least established, and it was somewhat active from what I understand, and there was some meetings and, and, and such. Since then, the, the committee has uh, gone away, essentially, and no longer active. So I think 
Um, we did have a request uh, to, to review this and see if there's an interest at the council level to re-implement the recycling committee and, and get that moving forward. As a, the only suggestion that I would, you know, as part of conversation, would be to whether or not if we do want, the council does want to move forward with the recycling committee and whether or not we would include a component of solid waste as well under that being that they, they seem to go hand in hand. But that is certainly something that uh, we'll, we'd like to hear some feedback on and whether or not the council would like us to pursue that. Council Beam. Um, last year there was a recycling committee Sorry. and I, I headed it and uh, we did have meetings and um, we did a lot of research and uh, we're hoping to implement some of our research uh, in the fall when school started. And um, uh, then I found out that the uh, Public Works Committee, under which the Recycling Committee had been formed, uh, had sunset. Uh, because it, that's the way it was written in, I guess, when it was started, and that was before I was on the council. So, for all intents and purposes, our, I felt our recycling committee didn't have the support of the city, or so we s didn't do anything about it. And uh, <coughs> one of the things that I was looking forward to doing if I was reelected was to um, ask the council to reinstate the Public Works Committee and the Recycling Committee, because I, I think they were we did a lot of research. We talked a lot about the things that we could do. And um, I think it would be a good thing for the city to have, uh, to encourage recycling. Council Clooney. So um, I would like to see us continue to look at recycling. Um, you know, we had the pay-as-you-throw thing come before us, and we, we didn't go through with that. Um, and so I think that um, our recycling rates aren't great, and we should be looking at ways to increase those. Um, so I would support uh, Councillor Beam in continuing that committee if that's her desire. It is. Mm -hmm. I guess my question uh, is the sunsetting of the Public Works Committee itself, this being a subcommittee of that committee, I agree with Councillor Beam, and, and I participated on the uh, recycling uh, subcommittee, and also w I am interested in, especially these next two years, of um, uh, accomplishing some things in, in recycling to improve recycling. So I'm, I'm certainly dedicated to that end. But I'm just wondering um, the logic of not having a public works committee, because I think it's an, an important um, committee and. Uh, um, some recommendations were were implemented and others maybe not, but uh, I still think it's uh, it's worthy to consider both of those, the committee itself and the subcommittee itself. Well, the, <clears throat> the mayor and I have talked a little bit about the uh, Public Works Committee and stuff. Uh, he, uh, he was the chair of the Public Works Committee at the time, and uh, quite frankly, between he and I, we were the ones that kind of drove the agenda uh, for the for the public works committees as we went through. Um, I don't have any objection to having some sort of uh, public works committee uh, overseeing some of the some of the work that we are doing. I, we in particular talked about uh, having them uh, help review some of the uh, the capital improvement plan projects. Uh, that we've had uh, when we first started out we had a lot more uh, items on our plate for the Public Works Committee to actually look at than what we do now and and what we've uh, discussed is perhaps doing some sort of limited uh, period where Public Works Committee would review sometime in the fall during the LCIP process some of the projects that we're looking at to try and give some uh, feedback for the council to use to help them uh, on that part. Uh, I don't know that you necessarily need a public works committee to have a uh, recycling committee as a as a as a subset of. I think you could have a recycling committee j just uh, on its own. 
it doesn't necessarily have to be a subset of the Public Works Committee if, if, uh, if in fact that is something that the council would like to do and stuff. So uh, we're open to whatever the council wants to do. So I believe there's probably some value in reestablishing the Public Works Oversight Committee, uh, including the, the Recycling Subcommittee, possibly some other subcommittees. Um, just as Mr. Jones said, something in the fall, review the LCIP, current projects, make sure things are on track, and if the council at that time has any other concerns or future budget concerns, the uh, Public Works Review Committee can yeah. weigh in on that. So if the council doesn't object, um, we could ask for a resolve on the next agenda to reestablish the committee under the same parameters and work from there to find members and mm -hmm. reestablish if nobody counts the clue. Um, can I just make one recommendation, and not to put Dennis on the spot, but um, that he be a part of that group since he has public works experience from the city of Auburn? Yeah, I think uh, Administrator Barrett was our staff person before, but I think with Dennis here, it's uh, probably a slam dunk. Great. Let's give him something else to do. <laughs> I just wanted to mention that one of the more controversial issues we, we've discussed um, in the last couple of years, and also it affected our budget hearings and whatever was the condition of streets throughout the city and that I, I think uh, that you know if, if we could get a report from the Public Works Committee on the status of roads and you know again it, it all sometimes comes down to resources and, and whatever so, but sometimes to priorities and uh, I know there are a lot of roads in this city um, that are in pretty lousy conditions I understand the reasons why some some cases that there's a lot of work that needs to be done to preserve the roads that are in pretty good shape and and that carry the the, um, the the bulk of the traffic but other roads you know we need to be safe and I think we, we talked about you know what we're putting forth as a community and um, you know streets are, are part of that and uh, and I know we, we work in a tough climate um, uh, physically um, and uh, uh, <clears throat> again it's a matter of resources I, I think if, if David was given a, a, a blank checkbook you could get it done but again where is our priorities what what can we afford as a community um, and uh, how do we prioritize and I think that would be like one of those elements where the committee could do some work to help inform the City Council to make really good decisions budgetary wise thank you council Councilor Beam? And, uh, and just to jump, uh, piggyback on what you were saying, uh, for instance, the sidewalk issue, the plowing issue, could be something that a, that a committee, um, this, the, the um, Public Works Committee could discuss and then bring to the council. We wouldn't have to take up council time at a workshop to, to go over every little street uh, that was on the list. So. Um, that's that's a, those both are really good issues and, yeah. and in the summer I remember when we, we went to our orientation and you were there and you were introducing yourself you said I'm Dave Jones and I'm, I'm head of public works and the, you'll get more calls about m public works than anything else and you were right. Of course I was. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't wrong. Uh, the, we get calls now for plowing in, in, the, in the spring and the summer. We get calls for you know, fixing the roads. Right. And uh, then, there, then, of course, the Public Works uh, Department is bigger than just the roads and uh, things like that. The Recreation Department is part of Public Works. Right. And uh, um, so I, I, I got a call about Recreation Department, too. And, so um, it's a big department and there are a lot of things that the committee could take care of before it comes to the council and then it would be just a, a, a committee recommendation. One of, one of the things that the Public Works Committee did do was go through and review pretty much in detail some of the sidewalk plowing that we did and in fact that was another thing that uh, the mayor and I discussed a little bit earlier today and stuff is that we had spent quite a bit of time taking a look at, at the sidewalk plowing list and revalidating we had a, had it in a pretty good order as far as the priorities and what what we were actually do uh, were doing <coughs> to council license uh, comment on the on the streets uh, part a big part of our LCIP, which is what I suggested that we might want to have the uh, Public Works Committee look at in the falls and stuff, is part of uh, 
uh, the, the streets uh, and what we are doing for paving in the following year and stuff is a big part of what our capital improvement program is and stuff. So that certainly would fall well within what we were talking about doing some sort of limited uh, public works committee as far as overseeing that. I again would state that I'm not so sure that uh, the public works committee would have to oversee the recycling committee. I think the recycling committee could stand alone on, its, on itself uh, and certainly might want to do things outside the limited time that we're talking about, maybe doing the public works committee in the fall or, or winter during when we're going through the capital project stuff where the recycling may be more of a year round type thing. So, so you may want to think about having that as a separate item instead of part of, but again, we'll do whatever the council wants to do, so. Okay. Excellent. So we'll take a quick five, we'll 715 start. Okay.
please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, our first item on the agenda is actually going to be some recognition. Um, we recently had a youth hockey team that decided to go win a New England championship. Uh, let them have it. I'm actually going to do this from here as uh, Coach Mike Ruthier here, their fearless leader. Somewhere, hiding in the hallway. Come on up, sir. I've got them in order for you, even. So we're going to call on the players here from the team. And the coach will hand out some certificates of appreciation from the city of Lewiston. Uh, first, we have Ace Watson. Axel Favreau. Oh, stay up here, Ace. <laughs> Will Ruthier. <laughs> and Ryan Malikas. <laughs> now, two of these young men are from Auburn. But this is what, what makes our community really great. These guys coming together, uh, winning as a team. They're now off to the NHL All-Star Game in Tampa, where they're going to participate in a skills shootout against some other teams. So I want to thank the uh, parents. I know being a hockey parent is uh, brutal. I've never had to do it, fortunately, but I do not envy any of you. Um, so thank you. Team, great job representing this community. Coach, thank you very much. And these guys deserve another round of applause. Keep up the good work, boys. Keep it up. Yeah, good luck. Thank you. And now the part we've all been waiting for. Update from the Lewiston Youth Advisory Council. Hi, right, my name is Emma Williams and I'm the chair of this year's Lewiston Youth Advisory Council. As many of you may know, the Lewiston Youth Advisory Council has been working on ways to help promote Lewiston and all the positives it has to offer. Our last event was January 11th. It was a forum of Lewiston as a place where people can achieve their dreams, a success story forum. I'd like to thank Council President Clu um, Kristen Cloutier and Councilor Mike LaJoy for attending, and School Committee Member Luke Jensen also came to support us. <coughs> it was live streamed on Lewiston's YouTube channel and on Great Falls TV, and we had a great turnout. We wanted to provide a, provide a forum where participants with either past and present ties to Lewiston could share their experiences and how they have succeeded. Those on the panel answered questions that Youth Council put together as well as questions from the audience. There was a slideshow that presented um, and highlighted photos of different times in the participants' lives. Those participating were Jared Tarcott, the 2006 Fitzpatrick Trophy winner, Emily Fournier, the owner of Eclair and Pastries, Briley Bell, Miss Maine's Outstanding Teen, Private Richard Parody from the Lewiston Fire Department, Paul Dion, a former mayor of Lewiston, Nate Libby, the Maine State Senator, Zamzam Muhammad, a former school committee member, and Michelle Crowley, a Lewiston High School teacher. Those attended wrote things that they liked about Lewiston on panels and where pictures were taken and put on Facebook and on the Sun Journal, which is, there's a picture in front of you. Recently, a youth council member, Isha Muhammad, shared to the group that she wished to have Court, graduating seniors of this year could have wear cords to indicate the youth council service. Eliak has been in contact with the, with the Lewiston High School and have received permission to wear double colored cords consisting of royal blue and black, indicating the school, the student engagement and municipal government. The, stu the two colors represents both Lewiston High School and St. Dom's as we usually have students from each school in the youth council. The next meeting is Thursday, Thursday January 25th at 5.30. And I'd like to welcome our new city council li li liaison to the youth council, Councillor Zachary, Zachary Pettengill. Are there any questions? Excellent. Thank you very much, Emma. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to acceptance of the minutes. January 9th, do I have a motion? 
Motion to accept. Motion second. to accept. Councillor Lyson, Councillor Cloutier, second. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay. Minutes accepted. We will now move into a public comment period. This is a period designed for any item that is not on the agenda at this time. Just any public comments regarding Lewiston City Government not already on the agenda. Going once, going twice. Okay. We'll now move on to the consent agenda. And Actually, we'll, roll call. Yes, thank you. So all roll call votes for this meeting will begin with the Councillor of Ward 2, and we will note for the record that Councillor Marcotte, the Councillor from Ward 7, does have an excused absence this evening, as does the City Administrator. Uh, all set for the consent agenda? Yes. Consent agenda this evening consists of six items. Item number one, resolve accepting the City of Lewiston's comprehensive annual financial report for the year ended June 30th, 2017. Item number two, order authorizing execution of a municipal quick claim deed for real estate located at 3 Mill Street Rear and 3 Moody Street. Item number three, appointment to the Lewiston Area Public Health Committee. Number four, appointments to the, Auburn, to the Lewiston Auburn Transit Committee. Number five, authorization to accept transfer forfeiture funds. And number six, amendment to the traffic schedule to create a 15 minute parking designation on a portion of Pine Street and Jefferson Street. So moved. Second. Motion by Councilor Cloutier, seconded by Councilor Lyson. Call the roll. Uh, Councilor from Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. Ward 5? Yes. Ward 6? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. And Mr. Mayor? Yes. Motion passed by a vote of 7 to 0. Item number 7. Uh, item number 7, public hearing and first passage on amendments to the business licensing ordinance and the vehicles for hire ordinance to eliminate the taxi and tattoo artist appeals committee. Requested action that the proposed amendments to the City Code of Ordinances, Chapter 22, Businesses, Article 2, Tattooing, Section 22-364, Right to Appeal, and Chapter 82, Vehicles for Hire, Article 2, Taxi Cab, Section 8254, Right to Appeal, receive first passage by a roll call vote, and that the public hearing on said ordinance amendments be continued to the next regularly scheduled City Council meeting. So moved. Second. Motion by Councillor Lyson, seconded by Councillor Ray. Any questions from Councillors? Now, now um, the Board of Appeals would be taking these up uh, as necessary then? Yes, that is correct. Okay. So that's the major shift and that's the way it used to be done at one time? No, uh, it used to be done that the City Council as a full body would hear the appeals. Mm. And uh, by nature, given some of the uh, backgrounds of some of the applicants, if they had any violations, particularly in their driving records or so forth, that would all have to be aired publicly at a city council meeting and on TV. And we just felt it got to the point uh, for basically an invasion of privacy for the applicants. So a couple years ago, I guess more than 10 years ago, the city council created the taxi appeals board. And then a couple years ago, we were saying the same thing regarding the appeals for the tattoo artist permits. So we merged the two boards. They only meet on an as needed basis whenever someone appeals the denial of their license. And this board hasn't met for over two years. So it's really on an as needed basis. So the mayor um, is one of his uh, initiatives was looking to sort of um, streamline the efficiencies in government and ask that this committee may be uh, redundant in the sense that we already have a board of appeals in the city. And could they take on this type of appeal topic in addition to the zoning appeals that they normally handle. Thank you, Kathy. To the public. Okay, back to the council. I, I will say I've been on this board for three years. I've never been to a meeting. <laughs> and I didn't miss any meetings. So I think this is probably appropriate. So anyone else? Call the roll. Council from Ward 2. Yes. Ward three? Yes. Ward four? Yes. Ward five? Yes. Ward six? Yes. Ward one? Yes. And Mr. Mayor? Yes. Motion passed by vote of seven to zero. Number eight. Item number eight, amendments to the city policy manual for city business license applications regarding lodging place. Requested action to approve the proposed amendments to city policy manual number seven, city business license application fees, penalties, and inspection and approval schedule regarding the fees for lodging place. So moved. Second. second. A motion by Councillor Lyson, seconded by Councillor LaJoy. Any questions from the Council? To the public? Back to the Council. Call the roll. Council from Ward 2? 
Yes. Word three? Yes. Word four? Yes. Word five? Yes. Word six? Yes. Word one? Yes. And Mr. Mayor? Yes. Motion passed by vote of seven to zero. Agenda item number nine. Item number nine, resolve authorizing the issuance of a quick claim deed for the property located at 8 South Temple Street. Requested action to approve the resolve authorizing the issuance of a quick claim deed for the property located at 8 Temple Street. So moved. Second. Second. I have a motion by Councillor Cloutier, seconded by Councillor Pettengill. Questions from the Council? To the public. Back to the Council. Call the roll. Council from Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. Ward 5? Yes. Ward 6? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. And Mr. Mayor? Yes. Motion passed by vote of 7 to 0. Uh, agenda item number 10. Item number 10. Resolve accepting the final report of the Immigrant and Refugee Integration and Policy Development Working Group. Requested action. To approve the resolve accepting the final report of the Immigrant and Refugee Integration and Policy Development Working Group. So moved. Second. A motion by Councillor Lyson, seconded by Councillor, oh, yes, by Councillor Cloutier. And I will actually start off here and remind everyone here, I know there's a couple issues here, I'm guessing why the house is full. Um, this particular item is a formality and a formality only. It is accepting the receipt of the report. It does not mean by accepting or by any of us voting yes or no that we endorse any or all of the report's recommendations. It is not also the appropriate time to comment on any specific recommendations in the report. This only means that we are accepting receipt of the report and that we're thanking the stakeholders who put the report together for their time and their efforts. So keep that in mind uh, on this item when uh, individual recommendations come up, which one will be coming up very soon, uh, will be the time uh, for comment on the report itself. So that being said, questions from the council? To the public? Back to the council, Council yeah, Lyson. I, I just want to also uh, include, and I appreciate your remarks, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, the information provided to us also talks about the five recommendations that were made, and obviously in accepting this report and the discussion, and I think we vetted this issue pretty well uh, uh, a week ago, um, but I think the support that I feel and see in, 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 in the hall here, there's still strong support wanting to make sure uh, both that the resolve uh, uh, gets put forward uh, and also that the, the council um, and the city as a whole kind of understands uh, that some of the recommendations that are in it um, are important considerations and there's lots of support in the community for them. And a lot of good work went in and, and I, again, appreciate um, uh, Council President Cloutier and others um, work uh, to make that happen and uh, again I think this is a, a very important initiative for the city and, and uh, uh, for us moving forward and, and really also um, accomplishing some of the healing I think that's necessary uh, not just in this community but our state or country uh, on some issues that are, are difficult and immigration is not a, a it's a tough issue um, and uh, but here in Lewiston, I think we understand how important um, our new uh, immigrant refugee population is, and how integration will work to, to better this city. And uh, uh, I just think that the um, the support in the community is is as it has been for a number of years uh, is uh, is strong, and I think uh, uh, will lead will give us a good direction as we move forward uh, looking at the recommendations in the report. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Call the roll. Council from Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. Ward 5? Yes. Ward 6? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. And Mr. Mayor? Yes. Motion passed by vote of 7 to 0. Agenda item number 11. Item number 11. Resolve calling upon the Maine State Legislature to adopt LD 1492, an act to attract, educate, and retain new Mainers to strengthen the workforce. Requested action to approve the resolve calling upon the Maine State Legislature to adopt LD 1492, an act to attract, educate, and retain new Mainers to strengthen the workforce. So moved. Second. Motion by Councilor Ray, seconded by Councilor Cloutier. Uh, any questions from the Council? Uh, with that, I'd, I'd actually like to start this item by calling up State Representative Jared Golden. 
was very familiar with this bill, and I understand you'd like to speak on it. All right. Good evening, everyone. Mayor McDonald, members of the Lewiston City Council, Bouchard. thank you very much. Bouchard. Wow. <laughs> You're done. <laughs> yeah, I get I get at least one strike. Come on. This is my first time. Might owe me dinner for that one. <laughs> sure, if he's watching, that made him very happy. <laughs> Mary Bouchard, good to see you. Thanks. Um, okay, so I'm uh, a little bit aware of last week's conversation uh, surrounding this legislation. Um, but I, I certainly didn't uh, catch the entire discussion. So um, happy to answer any questions that you have. First thing that, uh, you know, I should probably introduce myself to those who don't know me and are, and are listening. My name is Jared Golden, state representative. I represent Lewiston House District 60. Um, so uh, LD 1492, first thing I want to uh, make clear, I think it was, um, Someone said that I was a sponsor or co-sponsor of this legislation at the last meeting. First thing I want to say is if you look at the bill, you'll see that is not the case. Um, however, I, I've taken a, a special interest in this as it moves through the legislature, given that uh, certain provisions of it are specific to the city of Lewiston. In addition, I can give you a little bit of insight into the history of, of this bill. Back in 2016, uh, many members of the Lewiston community uh, brought uh, to my attention that the city of Portland has something called a welcome center, which is funded by the state of Maine um, through legislative appropriations. Uh, I was always interested what exactly that meant. Uh, was it a physical structure, uh, a, a building, um, or, or you know, was it just a program? What was behind it? I, I always kind of made the assumption that it was a actual office, uh, you know, a physical structure that people could walk into. Um, you know, and there was an interest here in the community to see something similar brought to Lewiston. Um, you know, there's a lot of similarities between uh, Portland and Lewiston in regards to immigration in, in recent years. And so, you know, people were wondering why is the state funding this resource for Portland but not for Lewiston? Um, you know, the, the numbers in terms of, uh, you know, immigration coming into the communities is not significantly different. Um, and shouldn't the state uh, be providing support to Lewiston and uh, not just to Portland? So originally I intended uh, in 2016 to submit legislation to do just that, uh, to bring a welcome center uh, resources to Lewiston. Uh, in the fall of 2016, I think it was, I sat in on several meetings with uh, individuals from Portland uh, who run and operate the, the Welcome Center. Um, other stakeholders who were meeting to discuss the state's workforce shortage uh, crisis, which state economists will tell you is a significant crisis. It's probably one of the largest challenges that this state has before it in the next one to two decades. Um, we're the oldest state in the nation and we are gonna have some problems finding people to do the work that needs to be done in the state. Uh, we already have that problem now, but it's actually only going to get worse. Uh, and so the, this group of people that were meeting had a much broader context uh, in what they were exploring and you know, trying to find solutions to than what my interest is, which is how, what can we do in Lewiston uh, to you know, make sure that people are getting the help that they need. Um, what I learned at that time was that there is no physical structure, uh, a welcome center. Um, what, what it is that is funded by the state of Maine for the city of Portland is really an initiative through their adult education program. Uh, it funds a coordinator position. Uh, this person's job is to not only help coordinate the English language learning services that uh, Portland's immigrant population needs and benefits from, but also to help coordinate efforts to make sure that uh, on the other side of that educational uh, opportunity is a job waiting for them um, by working with the city and, and other key partners in, in Portland to try and identify the skills of the individuals who uh, have come to their community. Um, mo many of them had jobs uh, where, where they lived prior to coming to the United States or to Maine from other states. Um, and it was really an effort to try and match their previous life experiences and skills 
um, with the needs of the community in terms of, of jobs that, that are available. Um, I think the idea being that there's not much point in training people if, if you're not connecting them with employment opportunities on the other end of that. Uh, I think we're, that's something we're all familiar with. Um, so um, the legislature has a process in place by which they try to limit duplicate bills and efforts. It's just a matter of efficiency. So I submitted legislation to bring that uh, Welcome Center resource here to the city of Lewiston. However, Senator Roger Cates uh, had already submitted legislation, which uh, is before you, which has a much um, broader uh, goal, which is to address some of the state's uh, overall, the entire state's workforce needs through, um, you know, looking at uh, how we can help immigrants in this state uh, get into our workforce. So uh, I was asked to uh, not put in my bill, but rather to be supportive <coughs> of this legislation. And, and frankly, I was happy to support Senator Roger Cates in the interest of, of working together in, in bipartisanship. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Senator Cates is, is a Republican from Augusta. Um, Augusta has started to see uh, immigrants moving into their community. Uh, I know for, for sure that um, they have a fair amount of Iraqis who uh, have fled that country and come here and are settling in, in Augusta. And um, Senator Cates, I believe, felt that uh, Lewiston was next in line in terms of getting state support, given uh, the, the you know, fact that immigra immigrants have been moving to this community for a lot longer and we have more, and therefore our needs are greater than Augusta's. But I think he also was supporting Lewiston, um, knowing that Augusta was going to need support from the state uh, at some point as well. Um, so what I want to tell you about this bill is what I support um, most about it are those sections that are directly relevant to the city of Lewiston. I represent the city of Lewiston and I want to make sure that everyone that lives here gets the education opportunities that they need and to the greatest degree possible, I think my job as a state representative is to bring state resources back here uh, to, to make sure that that happens, but also to the benefit of our property tax payers. Uh, when we get more state education funding, it means that we have to, uh, you know, we don't have to pay as much through our property taxes. So that is uh, what's most important to me about this bill. But I'm also happy to talk to you about the rest of it because I have followed it. So I understand that you have a copy of, of the bill in front of you. The first thing that I want to tell you if you've read it is I'm sorry, but it has been amended significantly uh, over the course of the last year. And I want to help you through that. So. Um, if you open up the bill to page one, two, and three, I'd like you to just go ahead and cross all of that out. This was a uh, effort of Senator Cates to create something at the state level uh, within the office of the uh, within the executive branch, which would be the governor's administration. Uh, something he called an office of new manners. Um, I believe that Senator Cates found through uh, the committee process that he wasn't going to be able to get the support he needed to pass that and because he had made a commitment to trying to put resources into adult education and English language learning and wanted there to be a chance that that would pass through the legislature this year, um, he went ahead and he cut out this entire section. So that is no longer what you would be considering supporting at this point because it's not on the table anymore. Um, on page three, well, you know, just for the sake of simplicity, anywhere in this bill, therefore, uh, where it makes any reference to an office of new manors, you can cross that out. On page five which is section five, having to do with vocation-specific English, English language acquisition and workforce training. Subsection one, program requirements. You can go ahead and cross that out as well. And I can't provide you a copy of the language that uh, they have inserted, but I will tell you um, the spirit of, of, of the change that has been made. Um, that the program requirements to the Department of Education, which is a state office, 
um, would call for their adult education family literacy office to administer a program to prepare immigrants for identified workforce needs of the state to accelerate entry into employment by combining vocation specific English language learning with training in the specific vocational areas that are required by employers. If you're wondering what that means, I read it um, in the following way. After working with the state to identify which kinds of jobs uh, there are vacancies that need to be filled and talking to employers about what kind of English specific, you know, industry specific language, someone who has a, a you know, level of English understanding and, and capabilities might need to know in addition to do the job. They want a program that's tailored to teaching them that, that kind of workplace language that they would need to come in and be successful. That sounds like a pretty smart, efficient program to me to help people prepare to, to get a job as, as quickly as possible. Um, further amendments under section six on page six. You could cross that out as well. And again, they're not just getting rid of it, but they are amending the purpose. Um, to make these grants for English language instruction uh, programs within our uh, adult education programs statewide and for any existing welcome centers in the state, whether that be Portland, Portland and Lewiston, or perhaps someday Portland, Lewiston and Augusta, um, the purpose of those grants would be prioritized to reducing the waiting list for English language classes. So I would encourage you to talk to the director of our Lewiston Adult Education Program to ask whether or not there is a waiting list right now for people to get into the, their, their programs that they offer for in, in English language learning. And if that's the case, then these grants might be of benefit to them. Um, the last thing I would say is that Senator Cates, being a member of appropriations, recognizes that money uh, is, is always something that you have to be <coughs> responsible about um, and, and be as conservative as you can. Uh, so he downsized the proposed amount of money um, significantly. So you could, I think for the sake of just being as efficient as I can say that the overall proposed amount at this point has been reduced from $745,000 to an 825 in 2018 and 19 to 340 in 2017, 18 and 410 in 2018 and 2019. In addition, since we are um, basically already halfway through the, the state's uh, you know budget system, uh, budget two year budget cycle, you could cross out the left column as well in all of those budget items and just think about this as being not only reduced by the amendment but cut in half. Um, If I were you looking at this bill, what I would focus my attention on most would just be section four, which you'll find on page four, which would establish a welcome center within the city of Lewiston. Again, that's not a physical brick and mortar uh, building. Uh, it's, it's one position being given to uh, our adult education center to help do some of these things uh, like um, you know, trying to coordinate immigrants' English language learning, which they are likely already seeking the opportunity to do uh, and take part in, um, in with businesses in, in the community, uh, with, you know, working with municipal uh, offices to try and make sure that we are tailoring people's lang uh, English language learning uh, to opportunities for them to, to find employment here in Lewiston. Um, Section five, again, the grants that might be made available if this bill were the pass, I, I suppose could be of benefit to Lewiston as well, but there's no guarantee there. So for me, what's most important is section four. Thank you. So last thing I'll say is why do I support this? Um, section four specifically, as I've campaigned through 
two cycles now going door to door, and, and Mayor Bouchard and I talked about this. We collectively have had a lot of conversations with people in this city. And I have come across many individuals who are very supportive of the, the benefits of immigration to this community. I've had many conversations with immigrants in this community and with uh, former immigrants who are now naturalized Americans and, and members of, uh, of this community. Um, I've also had conversations with people that were concerned and, and raised concerns about available resources and whether or not we could support uh, more immigrants uh, or you know just a, a continuation of, of you know growth and demand for limited resources like those that we have at our adult education uh, center right now. So two of the most common concerns I also have heard is that we need people to get into the workplace as quickly as possible because we don't have what it, you know the resources available to us for general assistance for many more people. And so I think that that is the first thing that this bill is all about, is making sure that people are ready to work as quickly as possible. The second thing I've heard a lot of people express concern about is that they want people to learn English. Um, you know, I'm not here to debate whether or not everyone that lives in America should speak English, but I, I've heard those concerns. I recognize the challenges that come with not speaking English, and, and this bill is really, again, all about making sure that anyone coming into this community that needs to learn how to speak English or needs to you know, sharpen their English language skills so that they can succeed in a workplace. Um, that's what this bill, again, is all about. So you know, regardless of how you feel about immigration in this community, I would hope that everyone would support this as a really common sense solution for our community and something that ultimately, um, you know, again, when the state gives us additional education funding, our property taxes uh, bear less of the burden of educating the people that live here. Um, I think we all know that federal immigration laws are, are set in Congress and at the federal level. Um, we have zero control, uh, to be completely frank, over who chooses to live in the city of Lewiston. Um, I'm, I'm in search of, uh, of the most common sense solution possible to help make sure that everyone that lives here can be successful and help pitch in to, to this community and work um, and feel proud of, of that work and, and just be successful. So um, I would propose that at this point, you know, you have a choice before you. The council can choose to support the, the bill in its entirety. That's, that's your prerogative. Or if you really just want to support something that's specific to Lewiston, then you can support section four or, or sections four and five. You don't have to support every section in this bill because to be completely honest with you, not every section of it would for sure benefit the city of Lewiston. It may, um, but it's not a definite. But section four certainly would. So I hope that you will consider throwing your support behind that and coming to testify up in the legislature in favor of that. In terms of likelihood of passage of the bill, I can't tell you one way or another. Um, the cost of funding this position to the state would be about $75,000. That's one position. Uh, it doesn't tell you what the role is or, or how that position should be structured. I would guess that that is something you would leave to the director of, of the adult edu education program who in Lewiston, who I know and uh, have talked to and, and I have a lot of confidence in, in the job that he does. I'm sure he could get the most out of that position if it does come your way. If it were to pass through an appropriations committee uh, in, in this year, uh, I think you would expect to not see that money from the state until fall or early uh, next year in 2019. So, you know, this isn't going to happen tomorrow. So, I think I've shared everything I could with you, and I'd be happy to take any questions that you have. On the council, questions for Representative Golden. Uh, so, Jared, thank you for. Um, highlighting this changes and um, if we're paying attention to section four specifically it seems that on page seven line 36 we're looking at $75,000 for funding for the city of Lewiston has that number been cut that is still no, that that will stay the same that Thank is you. reflects Senator Kate's commitment to making sure that the city of Lewiston gets uh, the same resource from the state that the city of Portland has received. Thank you. Councilor Clinton. Um, when will this come back before committee? Do you know? That I do not know. Uh, I can tell you it, it will move quickly. Okay. It's the second session. It's a short session. We'll be wrapping up our business, we hope, in mid-April at the latest. 
And so I, w I would guess within the month. Okay, guess I know that, that last week there, there, was, uh, there were counselors who expressed um, a willingness and a desire to testify. So if we could and just so you be know, on your yeah. list of people to call, that would be great. Absolutely, this is back in the education committee. There won't be necessarily another public hearing. There will be work sessions and members of the public are welcome to come and talk to the committee members and it will work its way right back through the process down to appropriations. Council Joy? Uh, yes, do you have copies of uh, the amended uh, bill? I don't, but I will leave both of these with either you directly, Councilor, or, or with staff who could make copies and make sure the you staff. all get them. Yeah. Yes, because I feel a little bit uncomfortable voting for something. Uh, having been up in that area for a number of years, I know how things change. So therefore, um, I would feel more comfortable if I had an amended version to look at. Yes, sir. I, I completely understand that. Council yes. Lesson. Um I mean, I think that <clears throat> this bill is really a, an avenue and an opportunity for some funding to bring some funding here uh, to accomplish a number of, of things but obviously it's not to be all end all as well I mean, it talks about also that position being um, you know working toward both private and public sector funding other funding grants and things like that so I, I think that uh, um, you know when we talked about the immigrant integration and our hopes and dreams uh, coming out of the, the study, um, it was a question of not do we want it, is how do we, f how do we fund it? And obviously this is one of those ways to fund at least a part of that. And I think uh, I'm, I'm inclined to kind of support a, a statewide approach to it. You know, uh, obviously Lewiston is the most important for us to, you know, it's our community. That's what our responsibilities are as counselors. But I do think we have a larger um, uh, task as well to make sure that the, the, the whole state approaches it in a, in a thoughtful uh, manner as well and that the legislature does so likewise. Um, so um, that being said, certainly when we go testify, it's, it, it's certainly um, we're from Lewiston and we're going to be speaking that way. But again, I think that, uh, and I agree with uh, Councilor Joy that, that it'd be nice to have the amended version um, and uh, for us to vote on it as a resolve uh, in our packet. Uh, certainly that doesn't lessen you know, my support at all and I'm, I'm willing to go forward based upon um, what you said as amended. Um, but if we need to bring this back uh, for the council at, at the next earliest of available time, you know, that can be done as well. So thank you for your presentation and and um, I think that what impressed me a, a lot is the fact that I've also done a lot of doors in this community in every ward uh, and talked about concerns that people had and you know the opportunities that are in front of people to get jobs are often tied into their ability to be trained and to have English language uh, proficiency and uh, it's also uh, having that proficiency leads to uh, things like citizenship, which, which is critically important, I think, for, for the stability of this community and for uh, the real true integration. Uh, so if you get the education, you get the language, you become a citizen, you get a good job, um, these are all keys to the American dream. And uh, a big part of, we heard many, many people say a week ago, we're here to stay, we want to stay. We want to pay back our community. Uh, we want to, um, you know, contribute as much as we can. We want to be good taxpayers. We want to be good citizens. And I think this is a, a big key to that uh, um, that initiative. And uh, certainly, as we move forward here, I think that there's lots of, uh, you know, opportunities to look on for funding. And I think this is a, a good one and a good, good place to start. So thank you. Thank you. Councilor LaJoy. Uh, the program, I, I like the looks of the program. I think it's got a lot of possibilities. And, and uh, uh, going back on the report that came forward to us, 
a couple of weeks ago um, is uh, a lot of progress was made. Uh, I was here at the time 17 years ago uh, and I saw the influx of, of uh, individuals that came in um, over a very, very short period of time. We've had many years under our belt now, and a lot of things have changed. Uh, and through those years, many of the younger individuals that came in as new Mainers have gone through their education process and are now either working within the communities or possibly going to college. So I think there's a lot of possibilities with this, and I'm encouraged. However, again, I'm, I'm uncomfortable in voting for something that I don't see in front of me uh, as amended. Uh, if, if it's permissible, uh, Mr. Mayor, I would ask that we table uh, uh, this item until we get the proper documentation that identifies the process, uh, and then we can move forward. We have a motion to table by Councilor Joy. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Councillor Pettengill. There is discussion on that, correct, Kathy? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so discussion on the Council right now, limited only to the motion to table, not the motion itself. Madam President? Uh, so in relation to the tabling, um, we obviously have a big crowd of people from the public who are here tonight. So I guess my request would be that if we're going to table it, which I have no problem with because I feel like everybody should be comfortable with their vote, um, that we allow people to speak if they so choose. Yes. And that um, perhaps if, if any of us have prepared statements that we want to make, that we make those tonight so that the people who came out tonight are able to hear those as well. I would, I would support that after the vote table, yes. Councilor Ray. Um, and can we have clarification? I believe you said that this would be um, voted on in the legislature before the end of the month, is that correct? No data set. No data set. Uh, but I think you can expect that, that it will come up um, quickly. So um, I would certainly keep that in mind. Um, you know, and, and if you haven't voted uh, on a resolution, for those of you that are supportive of trying to get those resources down here uh, into the Lewiston community, you can, I'll, I'll let you know uh, and, and monitor it so that you're able to come up and, and speak to the Education Committee and the sponsor of the bill, uh, members of appropriations. and and others again I think it's a great opportunity and you know I know uh, Mayor Bouchard has got some good I think thoughts about how he can make progress on this uh, here locally um, regardless of what happens with this so um, you know I would just say uh, lastly that um, even though section 4 is what I uh, think it is most evident um, you know evident that it will benefit Lewiston uh, just knowing some of your thoughts on how to work with the private sector on this, the, the grants I think are also basically approaching that in the same manner saying um, if there are businesses and, and private sector entities that are interested in being engaged in a program like this and working with the municipality that the state would um, pitch in grant dollars towards helping set up those types of, of programs in, in the private sector, nonprofit sector. Um, and obviously with section four in, in municipal offices as well. So thank you. thank you. So I guess I have concerns that our next regularly scheduled meeting isn't until the 13th, correct? No, it's February 6th. It is the 6th. Yes, the first and, and third. The first and third Tuesdays of the month. And the possi possibility of this coming before the legislature before our next meeting. Just so you're all uh, aware uh, of the process, when I say that it's likely to be have some action, some movement within a month, that would be at the committee level. So okay. after a bill was voted on in committee, it would still be some time before it moved uh, first to the Senate floor because the sponsor of the bill is a senator and then to the House floor. Um, so th there's, there's time. I mean, I would, I would encourage you to move as quickly as you can. I'll leave the copies. Uh, with, with, with staff here and, and hopefully you all get this as, as soon as possible and we <coughs> talk about it very soon. If we have a workshop next Tuesday, I know there's been some debate on whether or not we're going to, could we suspend the rules to have this vote next Tuesday? Yes, if there is a meeting then you would have the ability to suspend the rules at the meeting and, and have a vote. I'm not here. Which I know you're not here, Kristen. So I'm not here so. to vote on that and I would really like to. We'll vote in your spirit. Um, 
Any other? You all just heard him say that. Yeah. <laughs> I said we, not me. <laughs> Counselor uh, Pettengill. Just a quick point. I, I, I would like to say that I, I wholeheartedly support this, um, but I, I do feel the need that if it has been amended to, to have that language in front of us. Thank you. Okay. I, I guess I'll just chime in quickly. I know I tipped Senator, uh, Senator, ooh, almost. <laughs> Representative Goldenoff, to some of my comments, uh, you know, in general on this, on this Cates bill, I'm not going to be supportive of the resolution. I have a lot of great reasons for that. Jared's even smiling, so don't lynch me quite yet. Um, I think uh, I really want to take a good look at it now as amended and see what the nuts and bolts are and see if that maybe changes uh, my view on it. It may, it may not. I can't, I can't speak to that right now because I haven't read the new nuts and bolts of the, of the proposals. So. We'll start there, and with nobody else. Are you sending it me back? Well, this is a table. Yeah. So, oh. Yes. Sorry. Uh, is this not up to date online? That's a good the question. The powers of the internet <laughs> might Currently help we have us the out in this Powers of our packet. <laughs> I guess it's a procedural question. Could yeah. someone go print it? <laughs> so. I'll nope. tell you, it is, it is available <laughs> online. Uh, the, the legislative the website is, you know, is confusing for, for those that have not interacted with it uh, often. So uh, you, know, you have to click on the amendment tab to see uh, which amendments have been offered. And, and to complicate things a little bit more, you have to do a little bit of reading to see which amendments have been adopted. But um, it's, it's available online, and, and you can read and, and, and follow that. Again, this is on the motion to table. Uh, Councillor Ray, I mean, you're free to vote against the motion to table if you feel like you can quickly read this, uh, something of this magnitude and vote on it in the next minute and a half <laughs> to vote on it. But, you know, that is always your, up to you. Um, call the roll. So just as a reminder, what you are voting for is the motion before you is to postpone this matter to the next regularly scheduled city council meeting, which would, at this point would be February 6th. Um, Councilor from Ward 2. Yes. Ward 3. No. Ward 4. Yes. Ward 5. Yes. Ward 6. Yes. Ward 1. Yes. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Motion passed by a vote of 6 to 1. Okay. It has been tabled. However, I think a couple people may have shown up to speak. Um, so I will entertain some public comments. I will add, if we could, there are a lot of people here. Let's try to keep the comments brief. Let's try to avoid any repetition. Um, let's try to avoid any generalizations about any particular population, group, political party, etc. And the gavel will go down the first time I hear the word racist. So let's try to avoid that as well. So if anyone would like to speak, please do. Don't all get up at once. Uh, and not forget Ward to state six. your name and your address. Yes, when yes. You I know how this works, Mayor. Thank I've you. I've done sir. this a few times. Um, getting, uh, I guess, I'll amend my comments since this has been greatly amended. Going down, this, the whole Welcome Center ideas as presented on page four, this seems, especially under section three there, the functions of this coordinator slash center, since it's not technically a physical entity as it's presented here. There seems to be a lot of duplication when we think of our the Lewiston and the Auburn adult education since they basically have one director since the previous director and the director's here. And, uh, and, and then I'll put my county commission hat on. You know, that, that, that always goes well here at City Council. But anyway, about the work, about getting to workforce and the development issues of development workforce, there's seems a lot of duplication. And uh, then we get to the Department of Labor and their network of career centers, which we do have one here. There seems to be a lot of duplication there. And as the uh, representative Golden was speaking about, a lot of these issues, especially about people, people from overseas who come here about, let's say, have certain credentials back home, which under state and federal law and regulation is difficult to translate to uh, our credentials and what we require or what you. Uh, federal law requires you to have for certain occupations, teaching and 
medical, those certain, which are mostly enshrined in federal law and then state law replicates those to a certain degree. Obviously, as also as the representative said, that is a control of the district, you know, down in D.C. obviously, and, and their ineptitude since 1986 not to actually address immigration law, which was the last time it was in a comprehensive way addressed. So there seems to be a lot of duplication with this. And as I know from past experience, uh, actually I think Linda left, but anyway, resolutions are only worth the paper they're written on. And my experience with education, especially with, on, with the education committee and probably as Councilor Joyce know, who knows from a few years ago with criminal justice, there seems to be, there's, not, there's nothing guaranteed obviously through a grant process to the Wilson or Auburn education. And there seems to be some more corroboration on that fact, but I, I guess part of my original remarks were about the a lot of the duplication and creating a new part of the executive and how that's actually funded because the, the last year the, the, they passed a, their state budget and that goes through jo uh, the end of June of next year. So to correct the representative, we're only a quarter of the way through and there's this huge, and it's likely not to be a supplemental. You know, the governor hasn't put a supplemental in, I don't know what AFA and those that don't know that's the Appropriation and Financial Affairs Committee will probably do. But if, if they are to actually do a supplemental, I think there are greater needs, especially when it comes to our, as again, Councilor Verdroy might remember from a few years ago when he was on criminal justice about the uh, state slash county uh, jail system and there's no funding come July 1st, which that puts a huge burden next year on our, our property taxpayers here in Wilson and, and everywhere else in this state pretty much. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? Hello, my name is Craig Saddlemeyer. I live at 75 Maple Street in Lewiston. Um, first of all, just since we didn't have a chance to comment, I just wanted to thank, again, the, the folks that worked on the, um, the report that you uh, spoke of on the last item, the Immigrant and Refugee Integration and Policy Development Working Group. Thank you very much for, for doing that long overdue work. Uh, I think it's very important, and uh, I'm really encouraged by the first action that you're considering, LD 1492, an act to attract, educate, and retain new Mainers to strengthen the workforce. I think um, anyone who uh, you know, knows personally uh, these new Mainer families and who works with them, um, I've known many for a while, but in, in my work I'm uh, seeing more and more a lot of the profound, uh, you, you could describe them as profound barriers, but I, at the same time I think there's just also profound opportunities um, that uh, we're not taking advantage of yet. Um, and there's a lot of different ways we can be doing that. Uh, in a lot of my personal work, I'm certainly uh, trying to do that through, through the housing work, but I think there's a lot of uh, other great opportunities that we can be trying to take advantage of. Um, and I think that the spirit that, uh, of this bill that, as Jared Golden summarized it, uh, is really trying to do that, trying to uh, make more connections that um, just need to happen. And if, if you're on the ground uh, doing this work and, and seeing the, the sincerity with which people are trying to integrate, it would, it would just it would make complete sense to you. I think it would be hard to say no to. Um, w with regards to the concern about duplication that was brought up a moment ago, and I mean, I think that's a matter of speaking to the agencies and, and figuring out what they're doing and what's needed to complement what they're doing. Uh, I'm not concerned about that. I think there's plenty of room to, to specify it and make it work properly. Um, but uh, again, I, I'm, I'm really encouraged that this is before you. Uh, I hope you are able to act in time to influence the, the course of the bill uh, as it moves through the legislature. And um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity you are giving me to speak in front of you. My name is Eriti Nosso. I am an asylum seeker and I've been here for two years. And I'm living at uh, 73 Howard Street. 
So the reason why uh, I am in front of you is for two proposition. And the first one is about the, the bill. So I'm working at Immigrant Resource Center of Men, so my role at this uh, agency is a community education and prevention coordinator. So I spend all of my life with immigrants, so specifically the newcomers. So as we know, the language is something very, very, very important. You can have skills, but when you are not able to speak, or when you are not able to write something, you cannot express your skills. I can give you another example. Uh, I am an attorney at law in my home country, but because of language barrier, um, I can not really practice uh, law here in the United States. I know I improved in my life, uh, my life since I, if I have to compare my life since I came here, I was working, uh, sorry, since I came here, and if we have to compare my life between when I came here and now, so I, I improved my, my life. But just to tell you, language is something very, very important. So what we notice between us uh, newcomers, it's very, very important to have this program, Welcome New Manor, and to give more money to adult education so they can maybe hire other teachers. What we notice is for people who didn't speak English before, when they are going to adult education, most of teachers over there speak only English. So imagine for someone who doesn't know English, it's better for the person to learn the English from the language that he does speak. Because sometimes the teacher, uh, the teacher doesn't speak like French or Lingala. When the teachers try to explain to you something, sometimes it's very hard for them to understand. So I would love if we can see with this bill, if we can have more money so we can hire more professors, more teachers who speak other language so it will be uh, easier for newcomers to improve their English. And my second suggestion will be about, because I really love uh, what I just read here, what can we do in order to retain new menace here? So I'm living with many new menace here who needs to stay here in Lewiston because we are very grateful to Lewiston. We come from our home country. We didn't have money here, but Lewiston give us house. Lewiston, uh, because of men, we, we, we were able to eat, we were full stem. So we, we really need to be grateful to state of men and Lewiston. But there are some things which doesn't allow many, some of new men to stay here in Lewiston. Uh, as a part of my job, usually I bring people to go to apply for a job. I try to interpret to them and to apply for a job for them. And I, I, I usually hear from many new men, new men who say, I really need to stay here in men, but there is a problem of job. Like, like right now, do you whether there is a layoff? So many companies are solo. So imagine someone who needs to stay here in Maine, but because of job, the, the person cannot stay. So the person gets the idea to move to go to another state. If we can think how to have many employers here, so it will be a good thing to retain many new men here. And another problem is about the transportation. Uh, we have uh, the bus. The bus work only from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. So imagine some people who are supposed to go at work after 8 p.m. Having a, a, a cab is very, very, very expensive. So if we can see how we can uh, arrange the transportation here in Maine, it will be a very good thing to retain many new men who, who love to work for Lewiston to improve our city, but for some reason they cannot work here. And we can also create many places there are many places who, where people go to work, but the bus doesn't uh, uh, reach this place. So I would love just, I would just suggest us if we can think about in Lewiston to improve the transportation and to bring more uh, employer and to, to put more money for the, the English class so we can have many new manners who are ready, who, who love to work here to improve Lewiston. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Daphne Como and I was born in Lewiston, but I currently live in Green. 
um, Lewiston um, residents, Maine, need only look at Lewiston's history to know that immigrants, a strong immigrant workforce will make Lewiston strong because it already has. Most of what Lewiston has was built by immigrants. Um, and I recently read that um, one of the biggest deciding factors uh, for success for students of color is having teachers who look like them. So we have a teacher shortage in Maine, you've probably heard. Um, I think one of the most important things we could do is get, some, get immigrants teaching students so that um, those students have a better chance at success. Um, and then finally, I just want to say that we can't on the one hand complain about limited resources and then limit uh, people's ability to become and contribute to those resources. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, my name's Karen Lane. I live at 8 Wilson Street in Lewiston. Um, I'm disappointed that you won't be able to take action tonight. I'm disappointed that you weren't able to get the, the information that you needed. Um, I think that every person who chooses to come and live here is as important as somebody like me who was born and raised here, left and came back. Um, I'd ask you to the, consider the children that will be born here to the people that you're um, discussing whether or not to help. Do we want their parents to be able to support them or not? We're not only Lewiston residents, we're also Maine residents, and we need to keep in mind that setting an example of welcoming and supporting immigrants is something that we have a really important place in in the state. Um, anything that will help our community thrive, and I think that having immigrants here does help our community thrive, has my complete support. Thank you, Karen. Anyone else? My name is Linnea Hawkins. I moved to, well, Lewiston in 1999 um, after pinballing around the U.S. for a while. And on the subject of language, I will tell you the first time I heard dooryard or wicked, I was very confused. I caught on quickly, but I was very confused. Um, what I think we all need to keep in mind and picture with me, if you can, you go to France and you end up staying there permanently. How much would you appreciate having the resources there to learn the language, to learn the legal system, to learn what you needed to do to be able to stand on your own two feet? That's what this bill would put in place for our new neighbors who need that assistance. I don't think it's insane to make that available. I know I would appreciate it if I was moving to another country and needed that help. Um, I'm, imp I'm happy to see that the instruments are there to make the funding possible because I know that's an easy thing to latch on and say we can't do it because of this. But the instru instruments are there. So I hope when you get a hold of the, the final amended bill and get a good look at it, you keep in mind how would I feel if I went somewhere and they said, oh, you don't speak the language, we don't care. Just keep that in mind, please. Hi, my name is Kiernan Madurus Collins. I live at 280 College Street. Um, and much of what I would say has already been said. I think it's so wonderful to see all the folks out tonight supporting um, an inclusive community and a community where we support each other and try to lift each other up. Um, and I want to make one note, uh, which is that I came to Lewiston um, four years ago to go to college. My family now lives in the community, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm here year-round, uh, thankfully. Um, but I've been, I've been here for four years, and uh, nobody's ever called me a new Mainer. But uh, there's a lot of folks in this room who've been here for 15 years. And uh, you know, I think that, that uh, they are as much a part of this community as anyone else. Um, and uh, 
and really it's time for, for all of our uh, politicians and our elected officials to start treating them that way. So thanks so much. Hi, um, my name is Emily Manter and um, I live at 195 Holland Street. Um, I, much of what I've, what, is, what was, would have said have already been said. Um, <clears throat> and I don't know if um, you guys decided um, when you were actually gonna vote on this um, resolution, but um, I do hope that, I think it's important that Lewiston takes a stand on this issue. And I do hope that um, you can find a time to vote on it when um, all of the counselors can be present. Uh, because I really think it's important that um, every every counselor is heard on this issue before it goes to the legislature. Thank you. Hi, I'm Faucia Musa. I live 521 Turner Street, Auburn. I was part of the working group. As I was listening to everybody tonight and last Tuesday, one thing comes to my mind, and that's integration. We ask very often all immigrants, whether they're refugees or asylum seekers, to integrate, and even sometimes it's to assimilate and lose who they are. Part of integration is to be, to stand here in front of you tonight. I am not apologetic to be here in the United States because just like all the immigrants before me, I came to seek safe heaven. I'm no different, maybe my skin is different, maybe my religion is different, maybe I look a little different. But so what? So is the Franco-American and the Irish and everybody else who came to this country from a different form or the other, or different, in different ways. Um, when I came to the United States, I didn't speak one word of English. I also didn't know how to read or write. I was also an, an accompanied minor. I have not seen my parents for 22 years. <laughs> I'm sorry. But I have five kids who are born here, and my oldest one today was very excited to get accepted into an Ivy League college, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I tell my daughters that every day they are American. They are also the future of this country, and because of them, I decided every day, whether it's rain or shine, whether it's snow or it's hot, <laughs> In August, <laughs> in August, um, in August month, to push it. Are we learn people who like me who came the first influx and second influx of refugees learn English? We didn't have interpreters in place. We didn't have ethnic organizations in place. We didn't have anything in place. We learn by hiccup. We learn by falling. We learn by money trial and tribulation and errors. But that's all a testament to me standing here tonight. The idea of being an American and being integrated, the fact that I have the guts and the ball to stand here tonight and demand change. The change we ask today is not just for Lewiston, it's for everybody, whether you're brown or blue eyes. My current job is to educate people about lead education. I was asked for the first time two years ago to go and knock 222 units and educate them about lead abatement and tobacco cessation. I thought my work was crazy. Post 9-11 and me looking like this, I said, how do they ask me to knock doors? But guess what? I pick up the bucket, I took my daughters on a weekend, loaded my car, and I knocked every door from here to Shamus Street, to New Auburn, to anywhere I was sent. And I got nothing but a warm reception, even a few marriage proposals when I was knocking <laughs> the doors. <laughs> but that just emboldened my eagerness to learn, to integrate, and to become more or more of my new environment. So I'm asking you, when you think about that bill, before you hesitate, think about all the other kids who will benefit that. Because what benefits little Mohammed down Knox Street will benefit little Chani on Shaman Street. Thank you. Good evening, uh, my name is Mohammed. Uh, I live on 30 River Street in Lewiston. And I just wanna speak briefly uh, about this issue tonight. I think when we're talking about adult education and uh, youth and children are going to public schools and learning English very fast, uh, very advanced compared to their parents, 
uh, who don't have access to, uh, I mean, uh, who have, uh, who would like to have access or, uh, I mean, uh, a better system of education for adult. Uh, and that needs to, uh, I mean, the investment of the authority uh, that we have. And I think it's, it's really important to, to understand the gap that it creates when children learn faster the language than their parent and how that can create within the household uh, some uh, problems and some gaps within, within the household, within the generation living in the, in the same household. I think it's very important to, to address these issues because uh, we want parents to have uh, the knowledge to be, uh, uh, to be elevated, to, to, to teach their children and to accompany them uh, in the process of their learning too. Uh, for example, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good point. I think uh, many parents will not know what their children are looking on uh, media, uh, I mean, uh, what do you call it? Uh, YouTube. YouTube, Facebook, and all this. And it's important for parents to know what the children are looking at, what their children are watching. So I think it's very, very important to, to give more access to parents because when we're talking about adults, it's mostly parents and, and young adults. And the second thing I think it, uh, I will raise would be uh, I came from a country that this podium does not exist. So what I always thought is when elected officials will always look after their citizens, which means uh, uh, I believe that every elected, elected official would like to uh, be the leader of uh, a well I mean, a well-sustained uh, community. I mean, what kind of residents would you like to represent? You like to represent good citizens, and to create good resi uh, residents, I think you need to invest in them. And this is about that investment. It, this is about that investment. This is looking at the uh, coming 10 years and, Im and, and imagining what kind of Lewiston we want to leave, uh, how we can bring up uh, the, the newcomers and, and make them feel home and be part of, of, the, of the city. Thank you very much. Um, Vanessa Stas, uh, I live uh, at 75 Maple in Lewiston. Um, just a small comment to expand our imagination. Um, so the currently, uh, maybe someone can correct me, but uh, Lewiston, so the, the English classes, it's six hours. Um, in Quebec, where I'm from, when immigrants arrive, it's 35 hours a week, of course. Um, there's, you know, linguistic <laughs> reasons why, uh, but, uh, but also, like, I think our values are, are um, uh, translated into, into what we're going to offer uh, to the immigrant population. Uh, I'm an interpreter in the community. I work uh, with uh, many asylum seekers, new Mainers, that one of the, the biggest complaints is how, how little, uh, how little opportunity or how little time they have to learn English because, uh, like Mohammed said, uh, uh, that's how they can, they can uh, support their children in school but also uh, use their real talent. Um, uh, you know, I, th I think maybe, maybe, maybe it's, uh, it's on purpose that we don't want them to learn English because that way they can spend their uh, days and nights at barber foods. Um, but uh, we're talking about um, very literate people uh, with um, uh, degrees and everything, and we're, we're losing all that by not uh, providing them the, the opportunity to, to um, give their, their talent because they're, they're lacking of... Um, of the language and the education. Thank you. My name is Loring Danforth. I live at 446 College Street. And over the past 10 or so years, I've had the privilege of teaching English as a volunteer at the Adult Learning Center. 
And in the process, I've met some amazing people, among them a young man from Angola who's lived in China for 10 years and speaks fluent Chinese and has a degree in human relations. I've met a man from the Congo who's a pharmacist. I've met a woman from Djibouti who has a degree in uh, French literature from a university in France. Um, and they're amazing people. They're all really eager to learn English. They're eager to get a job and contribute to the community. And so I would encourage the city council to do everything it can to help the adult learning center and the adult education program in the city to uh, offer as much English to um, the new Mainers as possible. Thank you. Good evening, y'all. My name is Joyce Taylor Gibson, and I live at 583 Main Street in Lewiston. And I just have a couple of things to say. Uh, first, I've had a very rich opportunity in working with the group that Kristen led. Uh, we have many people from all walks of life coming to talk about what they do to help immigrants, to help citizens, who help make Lewiston the place that it is. So I want to encourage you not to miss this opportunity that many of your citizens and people who live and work here created in offering you this report. Uh, secondly, I want to say that this bill that offers us an opportunity to have one position, you know, is a beginning, y'all. <laughs> It's not going to solve all the problems. <laughs> it's not going to reduce, <laughs> it's not going to add significantly. We're not going to have any more problems once, if this, if this opportunity is realized. We still have work to do. So I want to encourage you to <laughs> take advantage of what has already been done create an opportunity to have one position, and then we can build from there. I trust you will do the right thing. Thank you. Hi, my name is Linda Scott. I live at 45 Pettengill Street. Um, I just recently ended my six-year tenor, tenure on the Lewiston School Board, and I would like to speak specifically to some of the comments that were made about parents and the need for them having more um, opportunity to learn English. Um, one of the biggest things I heard being on the school board was that my kids are learning English, but I'm not quite sure what's happening in the school system. And wanting to be actively involved in the schools, wanting to know everything that's happening in our schools, going to PTO meetings, enjoying the events that are happening, but not just that, also knowing what everyday little aspects are happening in the school and having this language gap happening in their own homes. I remember that language gap myself because I come from a French family where my grandparents and half of my family spoke French and I was very fluent in English and my sister and I would go blah, blah, blah and my meme would always say to my mother, what, did, what are they talking about? And I think it's very important that we recognize that if we want to ensure that everybody that lives in this community is fully part of this community, we have to in help them get there and this is a great opportunity for the parents and those that are not in our school system all the time getting the education and the language that they want to go even further in our community and I think this is a good thing and I think that we need to take advantage of this I don't think that this is an economic challenge on our community I don't think it's going to put any burden on our community what I think it's going to do is it's going to better our community and that's what we need to start doing and I am very happy that you're going to support this, and I hope that all of you support this when it comes back. And I plan on being back here to hear the vote, because I think this is a very important thing. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is Hawa Abdel. I am a community relations coordinator for Lewiston Public Schools. 
um, please consider this bill because this bill is very important to me. I personally work with newcomers, uh, parents especially. As soon as they arrive, they're like they're very eager to learn the English. So it's like, where is where can I take where can I take English classes? And I always direct them to adult education, and I support a lot of the works they do. Please consider this support. If Portland can do it, Lewiston can do it. My name is Bill Grant. I'm the uh, director of adult education in both Lewiston and Auburn. Um, and really, I just wanted to, to speak to the council and let you know that if you have questions specific to the bill and how that fits into Lewiston adult education's kind of strategic plan and our programming, uh, I'd be happy to answer those questions um, anytime. Feel free to get in touch with me uh, to, to answer those questions. And then I just would like to say, too, about um, instruction. Uh, that Lewis and Public Schools is engaging in a uh, project to diversify our workforce. It is a difficult thing because of teacher certifications, uh, but we're actually actively working on that with USM to try to uh, increase our diversification in schools. So, thanks. Hi, um, my name is Christine Baglieri. I live at Two Swell Lane in Lewiston. Um, I don't like talking in microphones, so I always feel the need to say that. Um, anyway, um, so I just wanted to say that when I was hearing you all discuss the bill, I was super excited and grateful for all the support that I was hearing from those of you who offered support. Um, and I understood correctly, Mr. Mayor, you said that you wouldn't support it either way. Is that correct? Not as written today, no. Okay, cool. Um, so um, I just want to say that felt super disappointing to me and um, you know as elected officials all of you you know um, for the city of Lewiston you represent all of the people of Lewiston who you see here today um, and I just really don't understand why an asylum seeker or a refugee wouldn't be considered a person of Lewiston who deserves the same um, resources and opportunities as anyone else. And um, I understand that this would be support for us. It would give us, I heard a number, $75,000. So I, I just feel like that wouldn't be a tax on the city in any way. It would be adding to our capacity to support the people of Lewiston. Um, and I just want to put out there that I'm from an immigrant family. My last name's Baglieri. My family's from Sicily. Um, my father was the third born of his siblings, and he was the first born in the United States, so I'm second generation. Um, and I come from a poor and working class background, and I take a lot of services from the state. I'm on food stamps, I just had knee surgery that was fully paid by St. Mary's, um, and I've been on main care. I mean, I'm poor, I need help. Um, and so I'm a citizen now, but it wasn't that many generations that I wasn't. And my family has been able to get lots of resources and support to be who we are today, citizens, we have jobs, we pay taxes. So I just want every immigrant to have the same opportunity um, regardless of where they come from. And um, the last thing I just wanna say is I've been to a number of, um, public hearings where certain words aren't allowed to be said, or, you know, as you said, Mr. Mayor, you would put the gavel <laughs> down. Thank you. Um, and I just don't understand how that works, like how that's not infringing on people's free speech. So, um, <laughs> anyway, so um, I just wanna say thank you all so much for your support of the bill, and Mr. Mayor, I really hope that you can support the bill at the end of the day and support all the people of Lewiston. Thank you. Hi, my name is Erica Woods. I'm an ELL teacher at Lewiston High School. 100% of my students are immigrants. And I go to work every day and I see big dreams in the eyes looking back at me. There is so much to capitalize on that. And I can promise you I'm part of the team that, sit, that tells these kids, you are entitled to nothing until you've earned it. These kids will come in here and tell you that I have said this to them. But what, there's so much to capitalize on. 
when I see these kids coming here, excited to be in the United States, exciting to have, excited to have opportunities that they have never had before. So anything that we can do to support them um, and the big dreams that I see looking back at me every day is something that I think you should consider supporting. Thank you. Hi, my name is Carolyn McNamara. I'm a nurse practitioner at St. Mary's Hospital, and I live at 7 Germain Street in Lewiston. I take care of about 1,500 patients, the majority of whom are immigrants and refugees. Um, I just want to give a little vignette. Usually when I meet someone for the first time, they're here, they have nothing. Scrape together $4 maybe to get a medicine at Walmart on the $4 list. Six months later, people have their work permits. If they've been connected, if they have family, they are usually privately insured. They might be working at LLB and they may be working in the hospitals, Conform, any number of local companies. If they don't have those kinds of connections, they may be in the same situation they were when I met them. So there's really sort of a divergence of people. Like some people get hooked up very easily. Other people have, have struggles because they don't have the connections. And I see this legislation as really bridging that gap and bringing more um, money into our community, bringing more money to our hospitals and helping all of us. Thank you. Hello, my name is Lauren Bro. I live at 45 Pearl. I want to um, echo the sentiment that I feel really uncomfortable about a gavel being dropped on Word. Just want to say that outside. I'll put it out there. Um, I'm sitting here and it's really amazing to get more of the details about this. And I appreciate all the talk and I appreciate the time that are taken, that's being taken to inform the public about this. I support it. But then at the same time, I was sitting there and I thought, it's time for a children's story. Because I have a five-year-old who often is feral. Um, and sometimes when I'm, you know, it is the job of a parent to teach their children to not be sociopaths. And she's been acting a little bit crazy. So that being said, I've been searching for books to kind of talk a little bit more about kindness and community and I found a book called Stone Soup. And I can summarize this in about two minutes, but essentially the premise is that three tired and hungry travelers come upon a, a town and they look for assistance. And the town has gone through hardship and everyone kind of feels like they don't have anything to give. So the three travelers uh, sit down and they talk and they decide the, the, the one thing that they have is a, a pot for soup. Um, it's the only thing they have in their position, the possession. So they go to the river, they fill it with water, they put a stone in the, in the pot filled with river water, and they put it under a fire, and they get it boiling, and just out of pure curiosity comes one of the villagers and says, hey, what are you making there? And they say, well, we're making soup. It's going to be delicious. And that person says, well, I have a, half a carrot, and they put half a carrot in. And another villager comes out curious and puts in a quarter of a cabbage, and so on and so forth. Everyone in the village ends up putting a little bit into the pot, and the end of the story is that the soup fills the entire village's tummy. It ends up being a communal effort to support everyone, and everyone has a full belly. So I just wanted to say that, for those of you who are very literal, that was meant to be a, a metaphor. Um, <laughs> It's also a folk tale that has been, that's traveled around many countries and cultures, so it's also a tale that's been around for a long time. And um, I, like, uh, I think the majority of people here hope that you vote for this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. My name is Patty Gagne. I live at 16 Bobby Street in Lewiston. Um, I want to say, first, one thing I heard is that services are not available to everybody here. And I think currently there are many services available here, one major one being the Career Center, which is being you know, paid for with our tax dollars already. And it is located right here in Lewiston. 
We also have the Chamber of Commerce here, who is here to welcome our new members to our community. Um, the Stone Soup uh, story is marvelous. I love it. I love it here. I've been living here my whole life, by the way. And I love all the new people here in Lewiston. Uh, I have many new clients for my business. Um, and I just think it all works very well together. But that Stone Soup is not paid by the government. That Stone Soup is by community members helping other community members. So I think we definitely need to encourage that more. And I thank everybody who works in this town already closely with a lot of people, including the teachers and, and whatnot. Um, and I think, you know, if it is the, the education program that everybody is looking to fund more, then let's look at tweaking adult education. Let's look at offering more classes there if that's what it's all about. Um, I just think we all need to do our part, but I just don't see the need for a new service to come to our area when we already have services here in Lewiston. But uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Patty. Anyone else like to offer a comment? Okay, thank you all very much for coming out. <coughs> I guess that brings us to... Back to the council. Well, <coughs> motion to table. Suspending the rules to let them talk. When we when we voted on that, though, I said I hope that you'll give us an opportunity. Do for you us want to, to talk speak. again? Yes. Please. Okay. All you have to do is ask. Thanks. Okay. Um, so I, I'll be brief um, because I think pretty much everything that I want to say echoes I think Jared's com uh, representative Golden's comments in the beginning. Um, I do want to apologize that I was the person that incorrectly listed you as a co-sponsor of the bill. Um, I clearly got confused between your bill and the Kate's bill and put them together. Um, and I also want to say that I'm sorry that we um, were not able to vote on this tonight, um, but I do think it's important for all the counselors to have the information they need to make the most educated vote that they can. Um, I would um, also uh, just suggest that um, for folks in the audience who haven't read the report, um, which outlines the services that are available in this community and the gaps that exist, that you go ahead and do that. Um, so over the past four years and pretty much um, my tenure on the council, um, I've had two fairly consistent conversations on this topic. And one of them has been with one group of constituents who say that they want people off general assistance, they want people working, and they want them speaking English. Um, and the second conversation is with another group of constituents that say they want to be working and they want to learn English. Um, and then we heard last week from someone at the State Career Center um, who told us that we currently do not have enough trained workers available to fill the job vacancies in the state. Um, so we have the jobs. We have a willing and able workforce in our immigrant and refugee population. What we clearly need are the resources to get them ready to enter that workforce. So skills, training, and the ability to communicate. In my opinion, uh, LD 1492 fills that resource gap, uh, and it does so in a way that does not put the burden of funding on the local property taxes. Um, Portland received similar funding a few years ago, uh, as was mentioned, um, and opened the new Mainer Resource Center through Portland Adult Education, which has flourished. Uh, and I guess my basic question is, why shouldn't Lewiston also reap those benefits? Uh, I think we all know that training people and providing them with language services um, that they require to be successful employees and contributors to our community makes good economic sense. It's also the right thing to do. Um, and it's a basic investment in the future of this community. Um, I also want to point out that LD 1492 is a bipartisan bill, sponsored by a Republican, as Jared mentioned, um, but co-sponsored by only two Democrats and three Republicans, actually, uh, in both the Senate and the House. Um, and so while I would have been comfortable on voting on the resolve as it stood tonight, um, I also feel like the amendments um, are <coughs> common sense, as Jared said, um, and I look forward to seeing that revised uh, bill before us on the 6th. Councilor Ray. I'd like to echo the disappointment that we are not <coughs> able to move on this tonight, given that um, sort of the timing is out of our control, though. Um, I appreciate everyone who took the time to address the council and um, let us know where they stand on their support and 
thank you to Mayor Bouchard for allowing this comment to continue. Um, one thing that I wanted to also address was uh, the, the number of constituents who spoke with their objections to limiting speech. And I think, um, I'm just speaking for myself here as a new counselor, um, I think we should probably look at what the rules are around that to clarify for future public comments. <coughs> Okay, I'll go. <laughs> Can I add one more thing? I'll go for quick. it. Um, I also just want to thank you, everyone in this room, for coming out tonight. Um, it's super important for everyone to have a voice in the process, and I really appreciate it. Um, and I just hope that maybe some of you will be able to return on the 6th. Um, and if you aren't, that um, everyone on this council will, rem will remember the comments that were made tonight um, and the number of them that, <coughs> were, that were made. Thanks. Great. One second, Jim. Sure. If you could, thank you. Um, to say that not supporting this resolve means I don't support new Mainers, work initiatives, et cetera, is completely false. Um, many of my objections to this are because this is something we can do in the private sector without burdening the taxpayers of Maine any further on this issue. This is something we've already got initiatives in place to do, and we already have initiatives working towards, and I think there are things we can grow at no cost to the main taxpayer. And that's where my objection comes in on this particular initiative, but that's not an objection to putting our new Mainer population and even some of our native population here to work and overcoming any of the barriers, whether that be poverty, English language learning, any of those things, those can all be done. Those can be done in the current system we have through, a pro through a partnerships between our nonprofits and our private sector. We've seen it work, it's starting to work, and we can continue to leverage that. So we don't necessarily need um, to set up another office, to fund another position, to accomplish these goals. I'm committed to accomplishing these goals. Do not read me by not supporting this bill as not committed to achieving these goals because we have a large population of people in this city of, a, of many colors from many different places, including right here in America, that we have made a commitment to and we need to uphold that commitment, and I understand that. And I will uphold that commitment. It just may not be with this particular bill. So, um, you know, before anyone wants to attack, just no. I am committed to making sure that we find a way to do this. Um, I just don't love this particular way myself. Um, on the issue of free speech, I'm all for free speech. Uh, I just realized last week we did have almost an issue. Uh, when we use certain words in certain ways, it can be used to incite, it can be used to stir the pot, and I know with everything that came out on social media today, I know there was some hubbub there, I didn't want to see that happen at this council meeting. So thank you all for being really great with your comments and council public. It was great, didn't turn into what there was a small fear that it could turn into. I'm glad it did not, and that was the basis of those comments. I, I never want to limit anyone's speech, but we really need to be careful, and again, we had an issue last week. I didn't want this to turn into a powder keg in here. I'm glad we can we can all leave as friends today. So, uh, Councilor Lyson, you had something. Yeah, I actually wanted to uh, thank everyone who came out tonight, and especially those people who spoke. Um, it, you know, this is one of the reasons why I'm committed to, to public service. Um, you know, we, we all love long meetings, right? We, we all love... <laughs> being away from our families and whatever, but to hear some of the stories and how moving they are and uh, to hear um, the trials and tribulations that people go through and overcome, and the people who are working hard in this community on the important things, uh, that's what's rewarding to me and that's what keeps me going. So I really appreciate uh, your input and your stories and, and um, your passion about wanting uh, to move this community forward. So thank you. Councilor, anyone else before we close? Excellent. Thank you very much. And I believe we are on to number 12. So we, got a, we got a vote on the, the tabling? We already yet? did. We already did vote on the tabling? OK, great, thanks. We'll have comment afterwards. Thank you. Number 12. So, uh, item number 12, annual appointments to various city boards and committees. And I believe, Mr. Mayor, you are uh, making nominations tonight to the Cable TV Committee uh, to reappoint two members, Sylvie St. Amon and Richard Wagner. Correct. Okay. 
Did we also do the CDBG last week, or would you like to add those today? We did not do CDBG. If you're ready to do that, I know you had, I believe, three. I um, have all four, actually. The other young lady is here, and I will, I will do it now. It's, uh, we're going to reappoint Sarah Goodrich. We will appoint Hawa Abdil, who's here tonight, uh, Jason Lavoy, and David Nielsen. Okay, thank you. So just for clarification, um, this, the cable TV committee uh, is nomination by the mayor and requires appointment by the council. CDBG is, is a direct appointment by the mayor, so we would need um, a motion to confirm the mayor's nomination for the two reappointments to cable TV committee. Again, Sylvia St. Amon and Richard Wagner. So moved. Second. Motion by Councilor License, seconded by Councilor Cloutier. Any, any discussion on the council? Public? Call the roll. Council for Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. Ward 5? Yes. Ward 6? Yes. Uh, Ward 1? Yes. And Mr. Mayor? Yes. Motion passed by vote of 7 to And reports and updates. I'll start with Councillor Ray. Do you have a school committee update? I do. Uh, so uh, we met. Gosh, uh, three times already uh, since our last report, um, we confirmed uh, Francis Gagnon as the chair of the school committee. Um, gosh, I don't have the date, I'm sorry, but our, our meeting. The 10th, Alicia. On the 10th, thank you, uh, January 10th. Um, we also moved to executive session that night. We also moved to executive session on January 17th and had our first regular meeting last night. Um, last night, we heard a presentation from the PBL committee, uh, which was made comprised of a number of um, administrators um, and a few teachers as well. And some public comment was allowed, uh, and we heard from a high school student um, who had some concerns about um, what will be going on at the high school next year. Um, so if you have questions about that, um, I think we will continue to explore that with the administrators and the teachers and the students and hoping to keep everyone apprised of that. Um, we also uh, mo are moving to a subcommittee uh, system on the school committee. Uh, there will be six subcommittees, teaching and learning, administrative, technology. Uh, I can get you the rest when I have that <laughs> written. I'm so sorry. Um, and uh, last but not least, um, I let the school committee know about um, this LD 1492 discussion that was happening tonight, as well as the um, acceptance of the final report from the Immigrant and Refugee Integration and Policy Development Working Group, and they were great, uh, very grateful to hear about that as well. Thank you. Any other reports and updates? Other city business councilors may want to discuss. Councilor Lyson. <laughs> Yes, I'll make a motion to go into executive session to discuss disposition of property of which the premature disclosure of the information would prejudice the competitive bargaining position of the city. Second. Second. All in favor? 